Buongiorno a tutti, benvenuto. I'm Christopher Apostle, uh, the director of the project committee and one of the board members of Save Venice. And I wanna welcome you today uh, to a, one of our ongoing uh, series of webinars uh, about Venetian history, art, you know, all sorts of different subjects. I wanna thank you uh, for joining us today. I want to spend a, uh, send a special thank you actually to our Save Venice members who are joining us today. As you know, it's your contributions and your support that help us do all the important work that we're doing in the city that we all love so much. I just returned uh, about a week and a half ago from Venice, and I have to say things are looking fantastic and we're very busy and I'm very proud of everything we're doing. Today, our speaker is Professor Shaul Bassi, and he'll be talking about uh, Shakespeare's two Venetian plays, The Merchant of Venice and Otello, uh, which, uh, which dramatized the, the complex bond of Venice with the sea. Can Shakespeare help us think through the threat of rising sea level and perhaps even suggest something about our future? I'm going to uh, thank you, Professor, for joining us. Um, Shal, I, let me introduce uh, you. Uh, Shal Bassi is a professor of English literature at Cal Foscari University in Venice, where he direct, uh, directs the master's degree in environmental humanities. His Shakespearean publications are varied. They include Shakespeare in Venice, exploring the city with Shylock and Otello uh, in collaboration with Alberto Toso Fei, 2007. Visions of Venice in Shakespeare in collaboration with Laura Tosi, uh, 2011. Shakespeare's Italy and, Sha and Italy's Shakespeare, Place, Race, and Politics, 2016. The uh, Merchant uh, in Venice, Shakespeare in the Ghetto, uh, uh, together with Carol, Carol Chillington Rutter, 2021. And most recently, Il Cortile del Mondo, Nuovo Storia dal Ghetto di Venezia, 2021. Um, he is the co founder and president of Bite Venezia, a home for Jewish culture, and was the coordinator of the cultural projects related to the 500th anniversary a few years ago of the ghetto in Venice in uh, 2016, where he spearheaded the production of the first performance of The Merchant of Venice in the ghetto. Uh, he's joining us this evening, his, evening his time, afternoon our time, for many of us, uh, from the Ka Casa Artun uh, at Wake Forest University, uh, where he's teaching Italian literature. So now before I hand it over to you, Professore, I just want to remind everyone, uh, today's uh, talk, uh, uh, as you think of questions, I invite everyone to uh, submit them to the Q&A feature, which you should see at the bottom center of your, of your screen. Please uh, enter your questions there, and we will spend about the last let's say 10, 15 minutes, trying to answer as many of them as we can. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to you, Professore. Thanks for joining us, and we're very excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much, uh, Christopher Apostle, for the generous introduction, and thank you, Save Venice, for inviting me. Uh, let me um, start by sharing my screen to make sure that I can have some interesting image for you. And uh, let's see. And this is it. Um, and all right. Um, can you uh, all see the presentation I trust? Uh, otherwise, yes. Okay, good. So uh, let me also thank Save Venice, all Save, Man Save Venice members and supporters for what you have been doing for Venice as a Venetian. I appreciate that very much. And I'm really honored to have a chance to share my thoughts about Shakespeare's Venice, but uh, today's Venice through Shakespeare's eyes. And so uh, the title that I have uh, chosen and the presentation I'm sharing with you will be uh, a bit about how somehow Shakespeare uh, writing 400 years ago uh, actually managed to touch on so many topical points. And so um, the uh, before I get into Shakespeare, I feel the need to uh, share what I consider a kind of a guiding motto that comes from one of the most important books that have been published in recent years. 
by Amitav Ghosh, a great Indian writer who's also written a beautiful novel set in Venice called Gun Island, where he, in a way, um, sort of dramatizes or fictionalizes uh, some of the themes that he uh, addresses in The Great Derangement. It's a book uh, about uh, climate change and the unthinkable of how our generation is aware that we have an unprecedented problem with uh, the environment, but we tend to somehow uh, minimize it, to play it down. And he says that the climate crisis is also a crisis of culture and thus of the imagination. So it's been mentioned that I manage a new degree in environmental humanities. And what we do is really we try to reflect on the environmental crisis, not exclusively from a scientific uh, or, or political point of view, but also from a cultural point of view. So this is my way of sharing with you some thoughts through, through uh, Shakespeare. And um, the way I've prepared this presentation is that I'm going to connect some ideas and mostly some passages from two of, uh, of the two plays that Shakespeare set in Venice with some artworks and the overwhelming majority of these artworks are actually artworks that have been restored by, say, Venice. And, uh, you know, and, and I'd like to start quite polemically to uh, show the difference between how Venice famously uh, presented its own image uh, with Carpaccio lion as an amphibian creature that tells us that Venice live partly on land and partly on water, and its wealth and its uh, uh, power depends on having uh, a, a life across the two elements, land and water. And on the water, you see the sea, the, the ships, and the ships are, of course, the, the, the vessels, the vehicles of Venetian maritime uh, network and, and trade routes and, and, and uh, of course, empire. Compare that to the homepage of the city of Venice celebrating the mythical legendary 1600th anniversary. And you see that quite literally Venice has turned its back to the sea. The picture that is offered shows of course the main island of Venice, but looks towards inland, towards the mainland, towards the mountain. And there are specific uh, political reasons for that because uh, uh, today the majority of, of of voters of the Venetian municipality live in the mainland. And, uh, and of course, I have uh, tremendous respect for that. But also, it, I think to me, it's a sign of how Venice is uh, now thinking of the sea more uh, as a threat instead of as a resource, as uh, 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 an ally, uh, 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 a spouse, as it was for centuries when Venice celebrating it, the marriage with, with the sea. And I make this point because the two Venetian plays by Shakespeare as intimately connected to the sea. Um, this is not, of course, uh, uh, a presentation that can exhaustively analyze the two plays. It's a way of reading them uh, uh, against the grain, as it were, and in the light of what is happening to Shakespeare and to Venice today. The two plays, uh, The Merchant of Venice, and the tragedy of Othello, the Moor of Venice, written a few years apart. Uh, the Merchant of Venice, a comedy, a very dramatic comedy written in 1596, 97, and Othello written between 1601 and 1603, have the uh, distinctive quality of incorporating the name of the city, Venice, in the title, which is very rare in Venice, uh, in, in Shakespeare. Shakespeare, uh, uh, of course, set uh, almost one third of its uh, play, his plays in, in Italy, but with a difference. Say the plays set in Rome are set in ancient Rome. Then there is, uh, of course, the Romeo and Juliet in Verona, Taming of the Shrew in Padua, and others. But I think, uh, arguably, that no other play has a city that is so essential for its plot. And to express the spirit of Shakespeare's uh, Venice, I think there is no better artwork than a painting that is uh, another uh, masterpiece that St. Venice has taken care of. This is the miracle of the cross at the bridge of San Lorenzo. Um, allow me to say that uh, you can actually see the, my son's window in this painting, something that I always say to impress my friends. And, I, and I'm very grateful to my 
uh, enlightened landlords because they still want to have uh, Venetian residents or their tenants instead of uh, yielding to the pressure of tourists. But uh, this is not the reason why I'm showing you this uh, image. The reason why I show you this image is because the image on the one hand represents Venice as a collective body, uh, Venice as a civic community, but in this civic community, um, where you see devotion, you see uh, different people mixing, mingling, uh, but you also see two outsiders. One outsider is the only person that is dressed in red in the, uh, on the right-hand side of the bridge where you see a whole group of people dressed in white. And then you see an African man, a black man on, you know, ready to dive into the canal. And of course, there's no connection whatsoever to Shakespeare that you know, uh, lived and wrote uh, uh, almost a hundred years after this painting was made. But to me, they seems to represent that interesting aspect of Venice that Shakespeare uh, um, sort of was interested in. The outsider in Venice, the stranger in Venice, uh, the Jew in Venice, Shylock, the moneylender, who is the most famous uh, character in The Merchant of Venice, and Othello, the Moor of Venice. In both cases, these two characters represent the uh, ability and interest of Venice of absorbing an outsider, actually to uh, um, be in need of that outsider for respectively economic and military reasons. And then ultimately, uh, the uh, necessity to expel, to get rid of this outsider. So this outsider is basically exploited and then uh, uh, finally, in one case, converted to Christianity. That's what happens to Shylock. And spoiler alert, you know, Othello you know, kills himself and um, uh, you uh, sort of, they, they get that rid. Um, the two characters, I think, are also speaking about Venice as a cosmopolitan community, something that Shakespeare was admiring from distance. It was mentioned that I uh, had the great pleasure of co-writing a book with Alberto Tosofei, who is you know, perhaps the best known and most entertaining writer on Venetian matters. And we explored sites of Venice that are somehow thematically related to Shakespeare. Shakespeare never set foot in Italy, most probably never stood in Venice, but uh, uh, Venice was so famous, so uh, um, powerful and compelling that it attracted the attention certainly of, of English writers and others. And this is why uh, Shakespeare took plots from um, uh, medieval stories or early modern stories written by Italian authors uh, that honestly few people remember nowadays and turned them into these two very, very famous plays to continue to occupy the stage to be taught and also to be made into movies. What you see in this slide, the pictures of two you know, uh, movies, uh, The Merchant of Venice uh, made in the early 2000s uh, by Michael Radford and the um, uh, Oliver Parker's uh, Othello made in the mid nineties. Now, um, what I want to do uh, for the rest of this presentation is to connect some passages from the plays with uh, today's topic. So I'm not interested in exploring the, the plots of the play. That's something that you can easily do in other uh, circumstances or through other means. I want to offer you a kind of contemporary Venice view of the plays, because I think that the plays have a lot to say about um, the city of today. And, and also about the city of tomorrow. And I'm afraid to say, surprise, surprise, uh, we have to start from certain uh, problems that are, are plaguing the city. And uh, one word that has been used to describe that is over tourism. The last few days are, have been spectacular. Uh, Christopher uh, was absolutely right that it, you know, Venice after the pandemic has had some sort of uh, reawakening, but at the same time, the tourist pressure has never been so hard and uh, epitomized by the cruise ships and by the sheer amount of people that uh, even not having a lot of fun themselves are crowding the, the, the streets at certain moments. And so the little 
game I play is that I take a speech from the uh, Merchant of Venice. Uh, this is a line spoken by the Prince of Morocco that is one of the suitors to the noble woman Portia uh, that he wants to marry. And he is praising Portia. And the little trick for me is to replace the name of Portia with the name of Venice. And you will see how uh, Shakespeare seems to be utilizing the propaganda that Venice itself was producing in the starting with the 15th and, and, and then developing or booming in the 16th century to attract people from everywhere. Um, the lines are basically saying that uh, everyone desires her. Morocco means Portia, but I think that Venice you know, is desired worldwide. And people come from the four corners of the earth to uh, kiss this shrine, this mortal breathing saint, and no physical barrier is enough to stop the people. Uh, even the watery kingdom, the sea, the ocean, cannot bar people from come. The seas are actually turning to brooks. So this is actually what literally this uh, humongous cruise ships do nowadays. You know, they uh, um, come into, into the lagoon. Now things are kind of changing, but uh, uh, still the message seems to be say, come to Venice, come to Venice, come to Venice. That message 400 years ago had, of course, a very different context. Today, we're still, I think, sending that message with uh, potentially disastrous consequences. My next image is one that shows that the sea was, yes, of course, rhetorically presented as uh, a little brook that could be easily uh, um, navigated and overcome. But at the same time, there's something beautiful about the psychology of the merchant that Shakespeare captures in The Merchant of Venice. And um, in act one, scene one, uh, there is a merchant says that even when he goes to church in the most solid, the most eternal edifice of stone, instead of thinking of the rock, like, you know, Peter, the founder of the church, so the most uh, uh, staunch foundation of Christianity, he thinks of the dangerous rocks that uh, just by touching the, 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 the vessel's side would scatter all the precious merchandise, the spices on the stream, the silks. Uh, and so the merchant, one second, is potentially the richest man in the city, and the next moment is nothing. And I have uh, uh, juxtaposed this these lines to one of the other masterpieces restored by St. Venice. This is uh, uh, Paris Bordon, Jonah and the Whale is a detail where you see uh, the sailors throwing Jonah overboard. So literally, we say that in the churches of Venice, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, Venetian merchants could really witness the dangers of, 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 of the sea, even though, by and large, if you look at the representation of the sea in, in, in Venetian painting, uh, most often than not, the sea is very calm, it's very quiet, and something very different from this kind of... Uh, warning that Shakespeare seems to be, to be, to be giving. Um, this is something I've learned from Deborah Howard, by, by the way. And then there is uh, now something that is not necessarily connected to the sea. Um, uh, I have learned uh, that St. Venice has restored both uh, the famous gobbo of Rialto, the hunchback of Rialto, that uh, this very peculiar staircase where the heralds would read out loud the new laws of the city and also um, uh, the glazed dome of the Martini Chapel in the church of San Giobbe, St. Job. And there is a funny thing that in The Merchant of Venice, there is a character, a minor character, an interesting one, that somehow is called Gobbo, is typically called Gobbo in modern editions of the play, so referred to as a hunchback. But in other spellings and in other version of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the play is actually called Job. And so uh, certainly a very unlucky character. So um, I think it's a tantalizing detail that we can connect to two sites that um, are uh, linked to, to um, say Venice. Um, and now we come to Shylock. 
Um, as it was mentioned, I was uh, involved in the uh, very ambitious projects uh, of the 500 years since the establishment of the Ghetto of Venice, 1516-2016. Uh, uh, the Merchant of Venice uh, was a very important component of that anniversary. I'll get to that in, in a while, but in the meantime, I, 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 I as a member also of, of the Jewish community, I want to thank St. Venice for also uh, contributing to the restoration of uh, several synagogues. Two of them are connected to the Merchant of Venice. Um, Shylock at some point uh, asks his friend Tubal to meet at their synagogue. So the question is, granted that Shylock did not exist as a real Jew, granted that Shylock famously wants to cut a pound of flesh from the body of his merchant rival Antonio and no real Jew would ever dream of doing that. Granted that, uh, if we want to use history as our guide, we would have to conclude that Shylock Synagogue would have been the German synagogue because only German money lenders were licensed by the Republic of Venice to lend money. Uh, certainly not even remotely uh, as much as the 3,000 ducats that Shylock uh, lends to, to Antonio. But if we take a different uh, route and we think about fiction, we'll have to remember that in the um, movie where Al Pacino plays Shylock that I mentioned before, he's seen praying inside the Levantine synagogue that you see uh, below his, his picture. So two, one is in the Ghetto Nuovo, the other is in the Ghetto Vecchio. Uh, again, uh, they are both uh, important landmarks in this iconic uh, quarter. Back to the cruise ships, back to the defiance of the cruise ships. Shylock is famous for his puns. And uh, the jokes may not be very good, but he reminds the merchant Antonio that no matter how many ships you have squandered abroad, you know, uh, Antonio boasts about his ships that are as far as Mexico and Tripolis. And Shylock reminds him that ships are but boards, sailors but men land rats, water rats, water thieves, land thieves, pie rats. And then there is the peril of waters, winds, and rocks. And I like to uh, use that very um, uh, ironic and yet very, very dire warning uh, to connect it to the danger that the cruise ships pose to, uh, to the city uh, because we know that collisions are not unheard of and that the disproportion between these sea monsters, another phrase from Shakespeare, uh, uh, is, is really still immense. And, and also in terms of the invisible impact, the pollution that, and here is a picture of a very famous activist, Jane Damosto, defiantly facing uh, from you know, her little rowing boat, one of these, uh, giants of the sea coming into the, the lagoon. In 2016, I was happily part of one of the most exciting experiences, bringing the Merchant of Venice into the ghetto for the first time. Um, this was a university project that we spearheaded. Um, it was a European project. We had the full cooperation of the Jewish community and many public, private and public institutions, and we were with a wonderful theater company based in New York, Compagnia de Colombari, uh, a multi-ethnic uh, company that uh, brought these memorable productions to Ghetto. And that was uh, important in many ways, also because it also sent the message that um, saving Venice to you know, uh, appropriate uh, the, the, the name of, of your organization is about restoring, maintaining the, uh, the tangible heritage, but also keeping alive the intangible heritage and creating a very, very um, fertile, productive cooperation between those of us who work and live here and cherish this heritage and the curious, creative visitors who wants to continue to produce culture in the city. And this is a point, it will be a point that I would like to conclude my uh, presentation with uh, a bit later. 
So what happened was that for uh, several weeks and two consecutive summers, several weeks, this company came together and the most audacious move by uh, Karen Kunrod, the great director, was to cast five different actors, including a woman as Shylock. Just to, I mean, there are many ways to interpret that. One uh, way is to say, uh, let's not confuse the fictional Shylock, Shakespearean Jew with the historical Jew that lived in that place. Uh, let's see uh, Shylock as ambivalent, complex, multifaceted character. And literally each scene was played by a different uh, actor and, uh, Jenny Lee Jones, the woman, uh, was uh, uh, delivered the, the, the famous speech, had not a Jew eyes, had not a Jew hands, organs, dimension, senses, the, uh, a very complex and, and again ambiguous speech, but one that has come to represent a kind of, you know, the, the, the sort of humanistic and humanitarian understanding of, 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 of the character. So the one point where you can say that, that you cannot dismiss the play as anti-Semitic, as you cannot say simplistically that the, the, the play is philo-Semitic. The play is very, very complex and it and depends how you use it. And what they did was not to import from elsewhere a uh, production of the play as much as creating a production of the play in close conversation with the community of the missions, the community of the mission Jews, and also the place, the sites, the synagogues. It was really uh, 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 um, a sort of a very productive interaction with the heritage, cultural and artistic heritage of, of, of the play. And as a uh, uh, quite special uh, collateral event, we had the tremendous honor of hosting most learned judge, the most learned judge, uh, Honorable Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, uh, who's deeply missed, who uh, presided over a mock trial uh, of Antonio, Shylock, and Portia. Uh, all these characters are, you know, Shylock and Antonio are put on trial in the play. Uh, um, uh, initially, Portia, that's dressed up as a judge, uh, sentences uh, um, Antonio to have his pound of flesh cut off by Shylock, and then she reverses her judgment by telling Shylock that if he sheds just a single drop of blood, he will have committed the crime. And uh, ultimately, Shylock has to give up his all his money and also to convert to Christianity. That, of course, is a very harsh sentence, hardly in line with the mercy that is preached by Portia. And what uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg did with uh, other uh, learned judges, both from Italy and the United States, uh, she uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, reenacted an appeal uh, and the strict court of Venice reverses that verdict and, uh, um, and of course entertained uh, a, a, a riveted audience in one of the most beautiful venues in the city. Uh, the Scuola di San Rocco, yet another place where St. Vannis has intervened. Um, and now from the Merchant of Venice, we turn to Othello. Um, Othello is a story, it's a love story, it's a, love, it's a story of jealousy. There's also a story of, it's a military story. And it starts with the fact that uh, the city of Venice historically was very reluctant to engage their own people as commanders of the army. They didn't want anyone to exploit uh, military feats to gain popularity. And so there was a tradition of uh, uh, recruiting mercenaries, or condottieri, to use a more elegant word. And so uh, I'm looking here at the lines, valiant Othello, we must straight employ you against the general enemy Ottoman. So uh, in the play, we hear Venice that needs to go at war with the Turks because the Turks are attacking Cyprus. Uh, and uh, a little detail that very few people remember, the Venetians are, are calling an, uh, um, uh, a captain from Florence, Marco Lucico, but he's not available. Uh, he's 
phone is off. And so they have to uh, go for the second choice and they go to Othello, the Moor. And this is a statue of the, uh, the equestrian funerary monument of Orazio Baglioni from 1617. So he was very close to the composition of Othello that say Venice restored at, uh, I think, uh, San Giovanni e Paolo. Othello, but Othello is also a great love story because uh, uh, the, the, the war with the Turks uh, becomes unnecessary, for reasons that we're going to see shortly. And uh, Othello, in fact, falls in love and marries in secret uh, Desdemona, the daughter of Brabantio, a Venetian senator. And in Orson Welles, beautiful film, one of the best, if not the best Shakespearean film ever made, Orson Welles' Othello, uh, Othello and Desdemona get married in the Chiesa dei Miracoli, uh, again, arguably the most beautiful church in Venice and another one that, say, Venice uh, operated uh, on. Othello is a moor, but what is a moor? Um, I could speak on this topic for hours. I will just give you a little uh, presentation on that. Um, Othello is about both love for the Moor, as the Mona did love the Moor, and also about hate for the Moor. Uh, Iago, the uh, lieutenant that uh, is first snubbed by Othello and then becomes his best friend and collaborator, and then Iago convinces Othello that his wife, his new wife, Desdemona, actually was unfaithful, and that leads to this tragedy where everything is a fiction. And um, a lot of, you know, countless studies have been published and continue to be published about the meaning of the word moor. Uh, I chose as the photo, uh, beautiful photo by Gabriele Gomiero that was part of the book that I wrote with Alberto Sofé, Shakespeare in Venice. Uh, one of the moors on the top of the clock tower in, 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 in Piazza San Marco. Um, but there are so many moors and every moor that is designated as such in Venice uh, refers to something else. Sometimes it refers to Black Africa, sometimes it refers to uh, uh, Arab Africa, sometimes it refers to the Middle East, sometimes it refers to mythical creatures like the case of the Moors on the Bell Jacks on the, on the clock tower. And so uh, what I think is the most important thing is that the Moor is not, if Shylock is a fictional Jew, the Moor is a fictional other that absorbs and connects different alterities, different types of otherness, um, different conceptions of blackness, different conceptions of religious difference, Islam. And the one little story that I think is interesting to share is the one of the Moors in Piazza San Marco. Uh, there is, you know, this famous uh, sculpture is, you know, known as the Tetrarchs, because in fact they represent uh, Diocletian and other three emperors that shared the Roman uh, Empire uh, at some point. But the four tetrarchs, sometimes in the Renaissance, became the Moors in several local uh, legends. And there's many versions of that legend, but one version is that these statues represent uh, some uh, infidels especially Muslim people that wanted to steal the body of St. Mark's, the patron saints of the city. And they were punished. And so God punished them, you know, struck them down. And in a slightly different version of the story, in fact, he petrified them. So that what you're seeing here is not the thieves in effigy as much as the thieves themselves that are petrified. The problem with the story is that the body of St. Mark was never stolen from the Venetians. It was famously stolen by the Venetians. It was, and the Tetras themselves were stolen, were plundered during uh, the crusade in 1204 by the Venetians. So I find this anecdote so revealing because it shows how the Moor is a figure of projection. It represents the stranger, the foreigner that we like to blame for crimes that we have committed ourselves. So Venetians uh, were you know, boasting of having uh, retrieved the body of St. Mark's, uh, but you know, a lot of our great treasures come from elsewhere, sometimes acquired in, in legal transactions and many other 
situations in less legal and very violent uh, operations. So the Moor is also a kind of you know, epitome of our bad uh, conscience. Um, just a little gesture towards uh, a curtain, a theater curtain that St. Venice restored uh, and then was destroyed in the La Fenicia Theater. You know, this is our presentation of the Battle of Lepanto and the Battle of Lepanto had been fought a few decades before Shakespeare wrote about Othello. In the uh, play, there's no need to fight the, uh, the battle because uh, the Turkish fleet is in fact destroyed by a storm by extreme weather, we would say, an extreme weather event. When the Venetian Senate is discussing the attack of the Turkish fleet, they are aware that, or they get a signal that, uh, they get news that the Turkish fleet is moving towards uh, Rhodes. And one of the senators says, this is not true. This cannot be by no assay of reason is a pageant keep us in false gaze. It's a spectacle, it's a show. The Turkish uh, wants to uh, persuade us they are going to one place. In fact, they are aiming uh, at another place, which is you know, typical war propaganda that we are sadly seeing very palpably in these days. But I want to connect these two lines to a different phenomenon, which is I think crucial. The phenomenon of Venice as a place where people are very willing to suspend their disbelief. You've seen two pictures that, two memes that have circulated widely during the lockdown. Uh, and the story was that because of the lockdown and the total absence of nearly total absence of motor traffic and of tourism, the canals had become so clean that all sorts of creatures had come back to it. And so you saw a picture of dolphins, of swans, but even crocodiles and flamingos were seen. And what really strikes me is that in many of the social networks where I saw this, and just many people were actually totally willing to believe that these stories were true. And so I want to use that uh, because I think there is both a danger and a potential when you analyze the uh, sort of global perception of the sea as a place where everything can happen, including some sort of animal miracles. And you know, so as an ecological, message, I think this is quite interesting. But I'm sure that you know, it's entirely uh, obvious to all of, uh, all of you that when people think about Venice, when they're not thinking about romantic Venice, they're thinking of Venice in relation to the sea, mostly through the eyes of Aqua Alta. Um, there's a beautiful simile, uh, figure of speech in the play where uh, Othello uh, compares his own emotions to the, to the tide and to a violent uh, tide, an unstoppable tide. And you know, this is, uh, of course, a picture from the destructive uh, Aqua Alta, the Aqua Granda of 2019. That was, uh, uh, of course, uh, a major turning point in Venetian recent history. And so uh, much as I think we need to reclaim uh, sort of healthy relationship with the sea, we cannot, of course, forget that today when people in Venice talk about the sea is mostly as something that we need to be separated from because of the more and more frequent uh, aqua alta. And as I come to my conclusion, I see also a big risk. Uh, and the big risk is that Venice uh, day after day, month after month, year after year, gets more and more commodified. When Othello is fully persuaded that uh, Desdemona has been unfaithful and that everyone is making fun of him uh, because he's a cuckold, and, and the great genius of Iago is that he convinces Othello that the best evidence that this is indeed the case is precisely that he doesn't see it. Precisely because he doesn't see the truth of Desdemona's infidelity, that means that she was indeed cheating on him. And so he says, alas, to make me the fixed figure for the time of scorn to point his slow and moving finger at. Othello is afraid of being turned into 
again, a sort of uh, monument or a figure that everyone makes fun of. And I think there is a great danger that Venice becomes not the vital, vibrant organism that continues to renew itself, but it turns into a fixed figure that just needs to be consumed. And in that sense, provocatively, of course, uh, the best evidence of that is the reconstruction of Venice in places like Vegas, Las Vegas, but also Macau. There are Venices everywhere because, you know, basically you can just have to reproduce it and you can also have cleaner waters indeed in these places. And next to it, I have, again, as a mild provocation, placed uh, a very famous site that is not in Venice, that is Juliet's Balcony in Verona. Why did I put Juliet's Balcony in Verona? Because uh, Juliet's Balcony in Verona represents a very specific way of articulating uh, the relationship between Shakespeare and an Italian city. Uh, uh, the balcony in Verona was placed there in, if I'm not mistaken, 1936 by the fascist government of the city, by a very enlightened member of the fascist government, after watching the George Cukor's movie, Romeo and Juliet, that was the first very successful Shakespearean movie. The facade of the Capulet's house had no balcony at all, but after seeing the movie, uh, the city of Verona says, wow, this is so interesting. Why don't we create a tourist attraction? And I consider that a very legitimate gesture of adaptation. So they adapted the city to the play and then created an incredible touristic phenomenon. Now, granted that the stories of the Merchant of Venice and Othello cannot be as compelling, certainly not as romantic as Romeo and Juliet, um, I, of course, would not recommend creating fictional or you know, uh, fake sites of Othello and, and the Merchant in the city. I would not like to see that. There are places that, you know, there are places that are Othello's house, uh, Brabant's house, uh, Shylock's synagogues, and these are things that you can uh, sort of have fun with. But um, what we really need to do to me, and this is my conclusion, is a completely different approach. And my approach takes the name of heritage community. What I saw with the production of the Merchant of Venice in 2016, what I have seen with engaging with many visitors who come to Venice to appreciate the various monuments is that the best that Venice can have is those temporary communities of students, like the one that are here in this uh, Casa Arton belonging with Boris University for semesters, like the students that come from Columbia University and many others that uh, should be mentioned uh, from different places who are not full-time residents like myself, but neither are tourists. And this is a very important thing. Uh, they cannot be the only solution to, the, to over tourism or to the loss of population, but it's so important I think that uh, the international effort of helping and saving Venice is not only uh, uh, aimed at the monument, which is of course indispensable, but I think a better effort should be made to encourage the presence of more heritage communities. What is a heritage community? I want to give you the specific definition provided by the Council of Europe. A heritage community consists of people who value specific aspects of cultural heritage, which they wish within the framework of public action to sustain and transmit to future generations. In that sense, there's no doubt that St. Venice constitutes a heritage community in relation to Venice. And I hope that all the international institutions that are doing something for Venice put a lot of energy and resources also in helping these groups of people who come to Venice for and with a creative or educational project. And that temporary residency is enough to turn them into residents in the sense that the lifestyle becomes that of the residents and they engage and interact with the local community. Um, so an example is that of the students, my own students of the new degree in environmental humanities here, and that's a line connected to a line from Othello. You see them during the harsh days of the pandemic, collecting water from the canals, 
that they sent to a Spanish artist that turned that water after analyzing chemically to music. And so that is an example of how students are essential part of the city. We need more students. We need more people to really think of Venice as the place that is transformative for their lives and that they can transform themselves into a place where they take care of the heritage. And my last image is one that um, is connected to the uh, nightmare of the pandemic, uh, of the lockdown, and of the Aqua Grande. I started with um, comparing uh, Porsche to Venice. Um, in both the Merchant of Venice and um, Othello, we have two Venetian women who get married. But in the case of Desdemona, the marriage that starts as a very unusual, peculiar wedding and marriage ends tragically with you know, Othello King Desdemona um, and um, the whole iconography of Venice as the bride is important. And you can see here a picture taken by a dear friend of mine uh, the day after the Aqua Granda when someone who had come to probably get married in Venice, you know, saw the beautiful wedding dress thrown into the Aqua Alta with the rest of the trash when everything was floating and the flotsam and jetsam in the city uh, created a spectacle devastation. Um, the other picture is one I took myself, I took, I took myself the day the lockdown was lifted and um, you cannot see my son there, but my son was there playing in Campo Santa Maria Formosa. And it was the first time that the kids could play outdoors with incredible relief. And that was a sense that Venice is, of course, the stones of Venice, but Venice will not and would not exist without its community. And on that beautiful day, uh, I saw, as I was really uh, relishing, basking into this uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, image of the kids playing, I saw a bride and a groom coming to the end with my sexist mind, I said, oh, now I know that the bridegroom is going to join the game and will ask the photographer to take a picture. And in fact, it was the bride. And the bride, you know, went in and I see that, you know, this uh, heavy husband was left behind, but the light wife participated in the joy of the kids. And so I see that, you know, uh, with a little poetic license, I see that also Shakespeare is aiming at this interaction between the visitors and the locals, both plays in written in the 16th and 17th century could not have, let's say, a happy ending in terms of integrating foreigners into the city. Today we live in a moment where only the uh, harmonious interaction of the visitors, the temporary residents and uh, the residents can really propel Venice to a sustainable future and I think Venice is the best candidate to be the one city in the world where the best minds can come and think about long-term solutions for the city, but also for all coastal cities in terms of uh, reacting to the great threat of uh, the environmental crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, Professor. Very, very interesting. And I have to say, some very both beautiful and slightly heartbreaking images, especially the one of the wedding dress. I hope uh, she had her wedding anyway after the, the floods. But uh, I'm gonna invite everyone to uh, send in some questions. I see there's uh, uh, one or two coming in, but um, I'm, do you mind if I start by asking a question myself? Um, this is a, a literary question. And I just think of these two plays, you talked about the otherness of, of some of the, the, uh, you know, the two main characters really. Um, or two of the main characters in each, uh, Shylock and of course, Sotello. And I just wondered if there was something, you know, certainly Shakespeare would have likely have known an African, I would imagine, you know, because they, I think they were in Elizabeth, Elizabethan England, there were community of, of Africans there, but I don't think he would have known uh, a Jewish uh, person because they, there was no community in England at that time. My question is, is there something about Venice that you think represented for him a place that this, that these people, these others could inhabit? And do you think, because I don't think of, 
you know, Verona or other cities, Mantova or wherever else he set his place, I don't recall other, or at least as strong other characters. Uh, is there something about Venice that's special in that way or was special to him? Um, thank you for the, the, the question. Um, actually, <coughs> scholars have uh, uh, determined that there was a minimal Jewish presence in, in Shakespeare's London. So, uh, or at least there, were, there was a presence of, 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 of Moranos, so Jews that had converted to Christianity after being or expelled or not having been expelled you know, from the Iberian Peninsula. But I think the question whether Shakespeare met in person uh, either African or Jews or both African and Jews is, is less important than whether, uh, uh, as it happens, Venice was in fact the place that triggered the idea of an international community. Mm. Uh, all the records, all the people from his age that talk about Venice, uh, even from firsthand uh, accounts, uh, experience, uh, uh, they report about Venice being this marketplace of the world, being a place where all languages are spoken, well, all religions are, are practiced, and, you know, as, as, as long as you don't, uh, uh, you know, proselytize or you don't talk too openly about your religious uh, affiliation, you, you will be tolerated. So I think there is both an attraction and, and a certain anxiety about this international community. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so uh, cosmopolitan Venice, I think it's, 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 a, it's a good uh, definition. Um, right. I, I uh, talked about that. Uh, this also helps me to, to ask the question that, that Catherine Mattingly has uh, asked, you know, whether there are tours in Venice based on these two plays. I'm not aware of any organized tours. I know that I myself have occasionally taken tourists around and in fact, every summer, I uh, teach in a, a Kafoskari Harvard summer school, and that is based on, you know, precisely on, on, on this vision of, of Venice as, as the city where Shakespeare writes about Jews and Moors. And we took the students to see all the relevant places that communicate the um, uh, ambiguity and ambivalence of the term Moor and the uh, specific Jewish history, comparing the history, the fact of Jewish Venice, the synagogues that existed with the fiction of, of Shakespeare. So I think there is uh, a lot of you know, learning that one can, can have. And so if, if, if uh, Catherine ever comes this way, please, she should look me up, be very happy to, to <laughs> walk with her. You, I think you just signed yourself up for a tour. So uh, Catherine, you have to buy him lunch at least, you know. <laughs> um, uh, Donna Serbe is asking, um, uh, some people are using the chat, so I'll read some of those function to ask questions. She says, she loves your thoughts about the need for more students in Venice. Could you elaborate on ways to promote this trend? And to what extent is this already happening? Okay. Um, first of all, hi, Donna. And uh, my, um, well, I think that there's now uh, uh, an awareness uh, uh, that, um, you know, in, 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 in my own lifetime, I've seen 50%, over 50% of the Venice population live in the city. And I think there are some cynical uh, sort of perspective that this happens to all historic centers and that's nothing we can do about it. And, and certainly the real estate market doesn't help. Uh, even though during the, the lockdown, you know, a lot of people who are living off the, the Airbnb economy uh, suddenly realized that that was not always the best solution. And in fact, you know, we had that strange moment where the city was uh, completely empty. But as I said before, I think that one should stop thinking just in terms, and this is something you read over and over again, this simple uh, opposition dichotomy, tourists on the one hand and residents on the other hand, because there are hundreds, if not thousands of people who inhabit the city, even though that's not their permanent home. And students are the best example. Now, unfortunately, and I speak from the perspective and experience of my own institution, Kafoska University of Venice, you know, the overwhelming majority of our students cannot afford to live in the city. And we could say that, you know, uh, commuter, commuting time is not terrible because from Venice to Mestre is 15 minutes, from Venice to Padua, half an hour, but it's a different world. And that also means that these people do not uh, sort of contribute to the life of the city as much as they could and, and they should. So the university now is investing in some 
uh, real estate to create new dormitories, but that's not clearly enough. And I think there is a wonderful, wonderful um, uh, project that I really want to mention. That's called Venuware. Uh, you may have heard of it. It's run by um, um, my, uh, let me write the name in the chat. This is a project run by my colleague and friend Massimo Valian. It's basically an infrastructure, a platform that facilitates and help anyone who is a smart worker whose job is portable to move to Venice. Because I think that even for people who deeply love Venice, there is, it's difficult to conceptualize that it's not a city where it's inevitably expensive to live. Uh, Venice is in many ways cheaper than say Milan or Rome or Florence if you take down. Certainly it's cheaper than, I don't know, Manhattan and, and the centers of many modern cities. Certainly it's cheaper than Switzerland or, or London. And it's a great city. It's safe. It's, uh, it, it actually has all the qualities that many cities that are trying to become more sustainable aspire to. Uh, and the picture of the kids playing in the campo is also a great uh, sign of how it is, you know, for instance, totally wonderful and safe to, to raise children here. So uh, Venuer is for someone who says, oh, you know, I have my job in my computer and I could do it from just anywhere. But of course, to move to Venice, I would have to find house, uh, insurance, and, and, and language, and, that, and Vanuware helps you with that. So I think this is really a very realistic project that uh, if someone cannot move here you know, full time, I think, you know, uh, please tell your, uh, your uh, uh, students or the young people that want to enroll the university, uh, by the way, I think it's important also to mention that many universities, our university and other universities in, in Italy are, and in Venice, are offering more and more English language degrees. And, and I'm not advertising that because, you know, uh, uh, for, for any commercial reasons, but I think, you know, this is really a moment where some uh, deep uh, reflection needs to be made about the future of Venice as a community. And, uh, and you, you don't do that unless you think of very practical ways of keeping this community because that community is also the one that knows how to take care of the beautiful monuments that that um, that uh, say Venice uh, uh, you know has has restored yeah that's that's and we try to support the Instituto Veneto as you know to train the next generation of, of restoration students um, and um, obviously we, we also try and support interns and things in our offices there. So I, I agree with you. And I think, you know, the, the programs you're talking about are, are m more robust than what we do, but um, every little bit that we can do to help broaden the academic and student community there, I think is a wonderful idea. Um, the next question that I, I'm, I'm seeing here, I'm gonna, it's also related to students. So clearly <laughs> you've uh, hit a topic people are interested in. It's uh, from uh, Victoria uh, Davidson, and she says, so interesting that your students collected Venetian water that was transformed into art. I'd be interested to hear about other unique projects like that that you could elaborate on, on which you could elaborate, maybe I should say. Uh, okay, I'm not an expert in, in art projects, but I can say that I've been involved and also have uh, simply witnessed many projects where artists uh, are really trying not simply to bring their own work to Venice, you know, ready-made, you know, they do something in their studio in Madrid or, or in, in, I don't know, in some other places, and then they bring it here. That's, of course, part of the, the industry, it's part of the great Biennale. But I see a growing number of tourists, of, of artists, who really want to engage with the local uh, community. And to me, this is, again, very, very important, because it's a, a learning process for the young people who work with that, and also does something really good to the city. I think it's very important that um, there is new art that gets produced here. Uh, it's been mentioned that I work with a Jewish organization called Bet Venezia. Bet Venezia has hosted, for instance, you know, uh, musician uh, from New York, Frank London, that did the music for the Merchant of Venice, but also wrote beautiful songs on the ghetto of Venice and other ghettos. So it was something very local and that became global. We hosted a number of artists for a project called Living Underwater, it's called Jewish Explorations of Climate Change. And again, the idea was to fully immerse 
pun intended, the artist into the local heritage, the cultural heritage, the artistic heritage, so that they could really take in all the beauty of centuries of art in Venice and then create something new. And that I think is the kind of virtuous cycle that, that we need. Uh, interaction, engagement, and that of course need a lot of, of, of support. Oh, fantastic. Well, look, I think we're just running out of time. So um, I want to say thank you again, Professor. It's been wonderful. Um, I hope I see you the next time I'm there. Catherine has promised to buy you lunch and maybe I'll go at the same time so she can buy me lunch too. Um, I just want to uh, remind everyone that if you do have other questions, um, do send them in and we'll try and answer them offline. Um, I think there are obviously many, many points uh, that uh, Professor Bassi touched on that we didn't get to because this could be another two hour conversation. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for that. Um, I do want to remind everyone, though, as we did talk about uh, very deeply about um, the environment and about uh, the challenges that uh, low lying cities and certainly Venice faces. Uh, to continue to think about consult, uh, con, uh, pardon me, supporting uh, the immediate response fund that was set up by Save Venice very quickly after the 2019 uh, Aqua Alta in November that year. Um, we've worked in over 22 sites uh, from the Lido uh, and all over, uh, all the way up to Torcello. So um, it's a very important uh, aspect of what we're doing and what we will be continuing to do because this is not a problem that is uh, you know, going to go away. Um, we have already raised $700,000 and uh, most of that has been sent. So uh, if you think about making a, an upcoming donation uh, to say Venice, uh, maybe this time think about the, the IRF, the Immediate Response Fund uh, to focus on instead of a general fund or, or project committee. And that's me, the head of the project committee saying that, but everything is being put towards the preservation of the cultural heritage, the artistic heritage, uh, and the world heritage uh, of uh, that Venice represents. So I want to thank all of you very much. I want to thank our supporters, our board members, our, uh, our say, Venice members, and I especially want to thank uh, Professor Bassi, who's taken uh, uh, some time of his day today to get us very excited about Shakespeare, about Venice, uh, about the environment, and about uh, students and learning, and uh, I could keep going on and on. So I want to thank everyone. I want to remind you that our next webinar uh, is in the not too distant future. It's on May 18th. I guess that's only uh, three weeks. Um, it will be on Giovanna Garzoni, a woman artist and musician in 17th century Venice, presented by Dr. Sheila Barker. It will be a wonderful uh, exhibition, uh, pardon me, a webinar. If you don't know this artist, you're in for a real treat. She's really wonderful and, and a very beautiful painter. So I want to thank everyone. I want to thank again, Professore Bassi for joining us from Venice. And uh, I'll see you guys hopefully either in Venice or New York very, very soon. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. All right.